I just want to welcome you to the channel. I've met with you a couple times before. You're uh, Marion Robinson the fourth. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, and you are a gospel producer. Yes, sir. That's wonderful. And I've heard some of your stuff. You do really great work. So I'm just really pleased to have you here on the channel so we can talk thank about you. some of the things that you do. Well, thank you. So I'm Marion. I own a little place called The Storehouse. We do all types of Christian music. So Christian music in every genre, um, EDM, hard rock, uh, traditional gospel, contemporary gospel, um, basically anything based on the like faith-based market. Um, anything that de that deals with music and that deals with faith, you know, uh, most of the music that is made is made with samples in various lengths. Um, and then I'm a live keyboard player. So we create beats and samples and, and different layers and mock up live bands and then run it out to this console. And basically that's it. That's the process. And it's a seven day a week you know, thing. So you work kind of like I do. You work in a hybrid fashion and I know you use a lot of samplers. So you're not doing everything in Ableton is what you use, but you're not doing everything in Ableton. You're still using Akai samplers. So yes. Okay. I'm going to walk you really quickly kind of through, through the process. So the computer is basically an arrangement tool. It allows me to be able to organized starts and stops of different things, song structure. It is essentially the paintbrush. Uh, it's essentially the canvas. We take samples from everything from vinyl to keyboards, drum machines, running things through guitar pedals. These are our paintbrushes and our colors. The hardware samplers if, if you some of your viewers will remember the old DAT machines of the late, I think, 90s, where you would have a mixer running into a two-track. Our samplers act as a backup for our sound sources in Ableton and as a two-track that we mix down to. Okay. And so, that yep. And then that's a studio master console you're running things through. And do you do the final mix on that console or are you just running things through it to use the EQs or tracking through it? Or how do you use the, the studio master? It is, uh, it depends on the, the session and what the client needs. If we're making sample packs, the console is used as a routing device to route certain things through hardware effects. Um, I keep several guitar pedals wired to auxes. Um, so for example, let's say we have a string orchestra sample that we want to put in a certain room. Uh, we'll run it out to a channel on the board, run it through a particular effect, print it, and then uh, use it in a sample pack for a client. We make custom sample packs for producers. If we're making songs, we will actually mix through the, through the console. And every single song that's produced um, and released, we got Bandcamp and DistroKid. I'll, put those I'll send those links to you. It mixes through the console okay. from Ableton. Ableton is a sequencer. We arrange the song here. We do vocals in Ableton through the board. We mix through the board, 32 channels down to an Alesis HD24. This is a hardware multi-track, uh, excuse the gangly cables. This is a hardware multi-track that's a hard disk. Okay. Once everything is printed here and we mix using the EQs and the compression and the hardware effects, we mix down to a two-track, five. Okay. So it's a very old school method of working. The reason why I went that route was pre right at COVID time, uh, Apple was switching into the M2 chip and I just did not want to have to invest in another um, architecture. I wanted to have one computer that could do 
everything and create a system where if the computer goes out, can I still produce release ready material? Could I still do a full record with or without the computer? Now I'm not anti-computer because I need to be able to see, right. <laughs> but, but to be able to have a system where we have enough hardware to continue making finished records without feeling any handicap, if that makes sense. Right. That's, that's what I'm doing. It sounds like you've almost got like a, it's hybrid twice in a couple different ways than what I do, which is, you know, I'll track onto the computer and then I'll mix back through the console. So, you know, I'll use the console for monitoring and when I'm tracking to, to do everything on the console for headphone mixes and anything that's in the headphones, but that usually doesn't go to tape except for some EQ. And then I'll mix everything back through the console, kind of like you're doing, but I don't, uh, I don't have the samplers or any of that involved in my workflow. You know, that, that makes, um, it, it, hybrid is fun because you're able to, I've been in, I grew up in the box. You know, um, I started out as a hip hop guy, you know, making beats and Fruity Loops and acid music way back in the nineties. And, um, and so I didn't come up in an analog workflow. Uh, but as I'm getting older and my eyesight is doing what us older guys eyesight do, nice. um, being able to have things that I have muscle memory, being able to reach out and know, for example, um, you know, these are my vocal channels. And so I have like, I have one strip of tape that's permanently on this board. My input list my track list never change. No matter what the song does, I have a, I got a track list that stays exactly the same. So I know, for example, I'm a choir guy. Tenor alto soprano are always here. The effects chains that I, I use on every song are already dialed in. The basic EQs where we're low passing that, you know, getting rid of everything below a hundred on the vocal, um, that little lift at 12K that we normally put to add air on the vocal. Those things are already there. And so it's just, it makes things faster. Right. You know, it, this works for analog. People think, people say, oh, well, analog is slow. Analog is slow if you don't know how to use it. It's, it's, it's paging through 120 million plugins. That's slow. Right. <laughs> this is, this is already set. Um, I got compressors that are literally mapped to each different element. Um, I got some pro VLAs. I love budget gear because at this at, right now, budget gear and expensive gear, the, the 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 margin is so close, you know. Um, so I have individual instruments. Everything is already pre-mapped. Um, yeah. So that's basically the workflow. It's it's try to have stuff set up. You know, people mix with quote unquote presets. You know, the only difference is that my presets are kind of real world. Right. And you know what sounds good. See, that's what I like about my analog gear is I know that piece of hardware, you know, because back in the day, that's all you had. You didn't have yes. 20 plugins to do the same thing. And so you got to know that one piece of gear really well and you could work with it quick and get a good sound. So, yeah, muscle memory. Muscle I know, memory. I noticed you have some DBX compressors and then looks like, are they 1176 clones or? Oh, uh, let me walk you through the whole rack. And the ART, so, the the art uh, VLAs, I love those. I, I love their uh, their gear is great for the money. I'm a big fan absolutely. of the ART. But I saw the DBXs and those 1176 style compressors, and so I was curious about those. And I can kind of kind of see what they're you, being used on. Go ahead. So let but, me walk you through the entire entire rack. I think it'll do a little bit of organization here. Um, so there's 24 tracks or 24 channels. I limit myself to 24 channels that have dynamics on them. Okay. And so at the top of the rack, I have a Alesis 3630. Um, okay. A lot of people kind of get snobbish when it comes to these or whatever. But as I studied the French house and EDM producers and their workflow, a lot of them back in the day, cop these and actually stick them on their master bus to like make um drum samples pump um so this sits on my 
808 and sub bass channels. And when I want, so in, in hip hop music, your 808 and your sub bass can fight each other if they're not, if they're not tuned properly and they're not, um, the attack and decay settings are off, they'll start fighting against each other. So I use the compressor as a bit of a transient shape. I'm able to make sure that my sub bass, the attack on the compressor from my sub bass, and the attack on the compressor from my 808s are different so that they breathe together, if that makes sense. That makes sense, absolutely. Moving down, and so moving down, I got a, a and this is a VCA compressor. Moving down, I have a Art, two Art Pro VLAs. Um, I have them in a weird spot. Most people use optos on vocals, on bass, on things that have sustained transient, uh, sustained, sustained transient. Okay, I actually have them on drums. This is why. Because sample drums tend to be spiky anyway. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the, the transients, they already compress the hell out of them so that they are punchy. And sometimes for gospel music, it can be a little bit too punchy. So running the drums through the VLAs allows a bit of a sweetening effect, if you will. Um, this is like, a, they call the VLA is a poor man LA-2A. You know, they call it poor man LA-2A. So, um, and then a lot of the kick samples are pitched as well. And so, instead of having a bass guitar, in hip hop, I could have an 808 and a kick that's tuned, the notes of the kick are tuned to the song. So having that, VL, having that VLA, um, acting on kick and snare, on hi hats and percussion, um, they just it breathes right. It breathes right. Um, this is going to be replaced. This is a Alto CLE8. It's basically an eight channel version of the DBX 1046 or 1066. I've I've ran this one too hard. It's dying, um, so it's not in. It's going to be replaced. I just got to figure out. I'm probably going to get like two 1066s to replace this because it's the same thing. It's a VCA. This one stays on keyboard sounds, pads, arps, leads, synths, sweeps, and risers. Okay. Um, even though I'm making gospel music, I think the workflow-wise, I think like an EDM producer. Um, I think like an EDM producer. So a lot of those sounds... Are there, but I'll run guitars. A pad is just a sustaining sound. So let's say we got a guitar thing, a distorted guitar thing that sustains notes through the chorus or something. It'll go on the pad channels. VCAs are really good for that. Below are DBX. These are my babies. DBX 166. These are the old style blackface. Right. I love the for vocals. Actually, like secret sauce if i could have a rack full of just these if i had to pick one compressor where i can only have one i would want to have a rack full of these but i love these on vocals okay most people automatically in the forums tell you to use the vla the vla is on vocals but when you got um when you got rap vocals where it's very rhythmic or you have passages in gospel music where they sing it real fast. Um, that VCA just does a better job of grabbing them, keeping them in the right spot, but not squashing them to death. Now we can't like I, I can put this on a drum bus and like I can I can I can make it go real real crazy like if we need to. Right. But I think that there's other compressors that do that better. These are Lindell Lin 76s. They are they stay permanently attached to my lead vocals because um, every like every major record that I've seen has used an 1176 on um, on lead vocal. For example, um, Jay Z 99 Problems, uh, Andrew Sheps mixed it, and the only thing that they used was the Neve console and 1176 on Jay's vocal. 
And so I've shot these out. They're only like, they're like 400 bucks a piece. I've shot these out against vintage versions. And for the money, this is the best 1176 clone possible. Like the warm audios, I've seen them all. And I know uh, I don't want to elicit, you know, warfare in the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> but but this for the money is best. And so in my in my belief, I believe instead of having one uber expensive compressor, have four of, you know, a cheap compressor that does the same thing. That makes last, sense to me. Last compressor. I got a VLA down here. This is my master bus chain. A Ashley CLE, uh, a Ashley PQX 576. It's a seven band parametric EQ, uh, seven individual bands. I don't have it on right now because I'm not working on anything that requires my master bus and a Art Pro VLA. I've shot, the art gear is amazing. I've shot this I out I against every SSL clone, okay? If you play this against a warm SSL clone, this for pop music will be the better mix bus compressor. Not because of quote unquote how it sounds, but how it reacts and it smooths a mix. A lot of amateur music, when somebody sends you a, a record, um, a lot of the sound choices are not the best. Sometimes you need a compressor that's gonna smooth out harshness. You know, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of producers they they turn up a lot of highs in their music and and different sounds and stuff, and sometimes you just need something that's gonna tame that stuff down, and that that art does that for me. So it lives permanently on my master bus, um, and so that's that's the rig. Excellent. So, that's that's amazing. And the the ART compressors that's a, a big thing for me. I don't have a VLA, but I have two of the TCS compressors, and I love those things on a vocal. I've I've, I've done entire albums where that was all I used on the vocal. I love art. Art. So art is owned. I don't know if they still are, but art used to be owned by the same company MXR that makes all of the pedals. Okay. And so that's why if you notice art gear is like bomb proof. Like like art gear, like these these compressors stay on like 24 hours a day for like five days a week. Like like I literally like music is literally my full-time gig. And so these these mugs stay on forever. Um and they just work, you know, they just work. Um as far as the rest of the rack, um, I got a a Behringer digital EQ that works as a uh, room correction, um, room correction. And then I have an old uh, Alesis MIDI verb that sits on, um, that sits on my aux four. And I got an old Yamaha Rev seven that sits on our aux five. And so Back in the day, people were recalled, would have a plate, a spring, a tape delay, a digital delay, and a couple of versions of chorus. And so that's why I hardwired this stuff where this acts as my plate. I've tried a whole bunch of different, I tried all of the plate reverbs and all of my gear, and I like the ones on, I like this one setting. It says Nashville. This is like a Nashville style, country style plate. I have the Rev 7 set on a spring reverb and those settings never change. They're like permanent. They're just like um, an old school studio that had an echo chamber. Back in the day, they would use one. They didn't have 20 reverbs and IRs and convolutions. <laughs> you had one reverb and that was the, either the reverb in the drum room or you would stick your guitar amp in the bathroom to get a certain sound. Um, and so I'm hardwired like that. Um, the rest of the effects, I use an Eventide guitar pedal. This acts as my tape delay. There's a million different sounds inside of this thing, but I keep this thing right at tape delay. This gives me my Roland uh, RE201, you know, space echo type thing. This is a Korg Chaos Pad, it sits on aux 2. It gives me filtered delays. Um, it has a lot of parameters, but again, it's, this is my digital delay. 
And then this is um, a Roland VT4. It gives me a hardware version of Auto-Tune. I never really use it, but it also has a reverb on, in it. This is on Alt 6. This is a BR4. It's an old Roland multi-track that records to zip disks, but I use it as an effects processor and it acts as my amp simulator. Back in the day, they had something called Cosm where it would, uh, it would simulate all of your different amps and stuff. So when I need to take something out of the box, and I need to run it through an amp. Instead of pulling up an amp plugin that would fry my computer, I just pull up. If I want a JCM 120, I pull up the JCM 120 preset. If I want a Marshall type of feel, I pull up a Marshall emulation and run sounds through that, and they work. And so that's the rig. Uh, that's the rig. You know, it's all about being able to to run pretty much hardware. Right. You know pretty much hardware um, and where the computer is any computer, PC or Mac, we can bring it in, um, connect it to my interface, which is covered in duct tape. I know this is like ghetto, but I use an RME Digiface. Um, it has 32 channels of light pipe, which interfaces are hardware. which interfaces our hardware recorder and this Behringer 8 channel. That's how we're able to get 32 channels in and out of the board. Okay, that's that's a great, really flexible setup. Is This is very inexpensive too. You get, for like $629, you get 32 ins and outs. And so it was the cheapest way to get the most inputs and outputs. And then you just choose um, based on your budget how you want that sound to go in and out. Um, the HD24, you can find these on used market between 300 and 500 bucks. Um, and they give you 24 ins and outs um, that are bi-directional. So I can switch between either mixing from the HD or running digital out of the computer. And for most projects, it stays on digital um, and it just runs sound. Even if I don't record to it, I can run sound out of the computer into in and out of the console at will. And, but I don't have to set up like monitor mixes and headphone mixes because I'm working pretty much either by myself or just with a singer or a group of singers. Um, and, and so I don't do a lot of band work. Um, I'll take it. But most of the things are people, they send me their songs and I basically create a track for them. Uh, I can mock up a band. I can play all of the instruments or program all the most instruments. Yeah, I don't know. A, a friend of mine that I grew up with, I don't know if you're familiar with him, his name's Arthur Latin, and he was the drummer for Harry Connick Jr. Yeah, uh, yeah. He was my friend all through like high school, and afterwards we played in a band together back, I don't know, late 80s sometime. Yep. Playing, playing just different kinds of stuff. I think we played like Lisa Lisa and the Cult Jam, and we played some oh, yeah. Roger Roger Zap, and we, you know, and that's how he could do that too. He could sit down and he had like a little keyboard, and you know, he was the kind of guy he could play any of these instruments, and he could do probably the best drummer I've ever heard in my life too. I think he's still with Harry Connick, but uh, yeah, Arthur was uh, was great. That's kind of reminds me of him because you put things together, you can play the instruments and you can assemble things yourself in the studio, which is you know mostly what I do, even though it's not the same type of music. Um, but lately, I've been getting into a little bit more of like the electronic electronic things. Um, I don't know about dance music; it's more like laid back kind of tracks. But I'll start out in the box with some loops, and then I'll add live instruments, especially live drums. I'll add that that to them, um, and then always mixing through the console, unless it you know for some clients I mix in the box just to save time. So yes, yeah. you know music is just kind of a I wouldn't say part time. It's my life's passion, and I've had a studio since around two thousand four. Wow. Uh, there's always other types of work. You know, the area I live in, we don't have a, a whole lot of recording and clients going on around here where you can make a full-time job out of it. So, 
Well, you know, my my bread and butter is is playing for piano or organ for gospel type churches. And so I just reinvest everything that I like. I live very, very, very frugal. And so everything that I make from playing my nine to five gig goes back into the studio. Uh, the studio is like a lot of us that own equipment. Um, we don't really make the equipment don't necessarily make the breadwinner of the money. It's just this allows us to be creative and allows us to be able to express ourselves in a way. I mean, if you look at Spotify, and the streaming income thing, like if, oh, yeah. you know, I create my own music, I have a, a band camp and, and different things where I have my own music. Those things are more just um, passion projects. But we, I reinvested into the music because what I found is that, you know, when you have your own space, you're able to take time and create. Now, you said something about like rock, um, about rock music and bands. Right. Even though I don't necessarily produce EDM music, but I study a workflow. Okay. And there are there are certain things that they do um, as far as their signal processing that I borrow. Like for example, this I know you you wig you rock guys a wig out on this. Like I love guitars, <laughs> and I wish I could play guitar, but I could play. I can do Van Halen leads on like keyboard or whatever. So I run sounds through the guitar pedals. Like, um, like just this morning, early morning, I did a session. This kind of like a alt metal type of a alt metal type of thing, gospel metal thing. And so we're running synth guitars through. You know, if you pan one to the left and pan one to the right. Um, I got one running through a stack of two running through the uh, ne the nano, and then I got a set of two running through the tube screamer, and you just you know you balance them out where it sounds like you've recorded through two separate amps. Right. You know, it just gives you that that sound. I use um, reamps. I like to use a reamp, and I'll use pedals on anything, especially I like the Univibe, you know, the old Jimi Hendrix, the sort of yes. Univibe. I like to put that on vocals. I'll run it off, off of an aux in through, uh, through a reamp, and then I'll put it on vocals. So, so my, my reamp system is, okay, my reamp system is kind of is kind of ghetto. Univibe, the, the, the thing that gives me that Univibe feel is a TC electronic pedal um, called the Vibe Vicious, and it does like it does chorus, it does vibrato, and so it's like a, it's a lot of different a lot of different things. Like for example, like when I'm using keyboard organ, and to keep the keyboard organ where it sounds more like a B3, when I don't want to fire up the B3, you put it through an overdrive pedal. This is a JS JHX three JHS three series overdrive. You overdrive it, and then you run it through the vibrato. And it gives you that scanner sound that you get um, from a Leslie. Very yeah. simple. Like, so it's the same thing. You know, it's like all of us, you know, we work different genres, but the workflow is the same. The signal processing is the same. Like I learned a lot from all of this analog stuff. I learned from rock, from you rock guys. Like, cause the hip hop guys were all in the box, you know, and so, like, I learned this from rock guys with bands, you know? And so, man. But, yeah, I could talk about this stuff all day, man. Whatever works, you know? I like to use, I use a little bit of everything, and I like working on all kinds of music as well. I've done some productions of some more electronic type stuff, ambient music and, and things like that. I think you can, you know, I just... I just like the analog workflow and that's I yeah. start I started in the analog days. I mean I started with a four track in my parents' barn and an old P V mixer so that oh, I could wow. record drums because my dad was a drummer and had a drum set and actually the same set that's in my studio today, the sixty seven Ludwigs were my dad's. And you so know, I started out that way. How um I got a question concerning your sapphire. Sure. Um how do how do you like 
um, how does the preamps, how do they overdrive? Like, I know, like, you can drive a signal into a anything analog, and it just, it has its own breakup. I know my studio master, uh, I could turn that thing into, I could turn the channel into a full-blown fuzz pedal if I wanted to. But it does, it gets, it's a certain sweet spot where drums get really crunchy, like, in a in a good like in almost like a a, a type of saturation how is the saturation on your board it's pretty good this board has a lot of headroom the preamps on this sapphire have a ton of headroom but when mm -hmm. you start to when you start to really drive them hard they don't really break up so much until until you really really pushing them they don't break up they kind of get a little bigger and a little woolier and they just sound good, but they still stay nice and clean on the high end. And you can get, I mean, the transient response out of this console is really, really good compared to anything else I've ever used. You get that entire waveform when you have the attack of a, a live acoustic drum using these preamps. You don't really lose any of that attack, but it has a subtle, like, warming effect the more you drive it. And if you drive it real st hard, it starts to break up really nice, but break up like a tube preamp almost, like the old Western electric that you hear on so certain vocal tracks from the 60s, where the, the yeah. vocalist, you could tell the equipment just couldn't handle the vocalist. He was just too powerful, or, or she was, you know, and it's overdriving that tube preamp just a little bit, where you hear that little bit of edge on the voice. Yeah. This will kind of do that, too, in a, a little more flat way not quite as spiky but it gets that it gets a little bit of that but you really have to drive it pretty hard and then some of these had a transformer they all have a transformer option for the mic preamps uh, uh, and mine only has the transformers on the first eight channels and i usually use those on drums so out of like the big three out of the big three like ssl api needs like if you were to compare your console in like headroom and response to something out of the big three, what world would it sit in? It would be hard to say because I've not ever used an SSL or a Neve in person. Um, I've used API preamps. It's kind of like that, but it's got, I've used a Trident and it sounds closer oh. to that than anything else. A Trident ADB, I used one of those, but it was a long time ago. So again, this is comparing something from 30 years ago to what I hear in the studio today with this console. So I'm really not sure how to, to answer that. Other than it, does oh, sound, it does sound pretty you British. Have. You know, I've owned some you know, other no, sound no, no. crafts. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an absolutely thorough answer. Because even if you haven't worked on it personally, like we listen to records, like, you know, all of us that make music, we listen to records all the time. And, you know, you pull up, you pull up a person's record that you like and you can start looking in the tape out magazine and the different things about what did they use to cut that record. Uh, you know, like, for example, Dr. Dre um, out of the, the, the 2000s, you know, he was SSL. So when I need to ref reference a particular console sound, you just go grab the record that's where, oh, this guy mixed this through an SSL. Okay, well, if you listen to the record, then you didn't hear what an SSL sounds like. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, and so that's 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 good. The reason for my question, like, see, my board ain't nowhere, is nowhere. My board is a big muff. My, bug, my, my board is not an SSL, it's not an API. It is a, it is a set of, imagine a 24-channel big muff pedal. Right. It, it 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 bakes. So I do a lot of 80s like Wu Tang, Wu Tang clanish type sample techniques. Um De La Soul, a lot of the, like vintage hip hop where they're using a lot of jazz drum breaks that are already had a certain like distortion on them that's good. Mm -hmm. And it just it drives. I have a swept, my EQ has a swept low and swept mid that goes to like 25 hertz like it goes down really really low um and so it's great for hard drums hard rock drums hard guitars absolutely amazing very little headroom though yeah and so the way the way i get around it is i just run the mix output very low 
into the mastering chain that I little mix bus chain and I use the mix bus chain to optimize the game going to the two track if that makes sense that does make sense that's uh that's you kind of what I do sometimes here I'll put a, a set of uh louder than liftoff royal blue color modules on the inserts of the master bus on the sapphire oh. if I, if I want to get a little bit bigger sound I just add some transformers that way to the outputs and then the little color modules have their own input and output so I can drive those modules and then cut the output down to get my level going back in for the mix down so but the sapphire doesn't really need help I don't hardly use anything on its master bus not even really a master bus compressor most of the time it just sounds big and deep and yep. wide and probably kind of I'd say probably the closest is pretty clean so it's probably closer to an SSL than an EVE or an API it doesn't have that mid forward thing or that really woolly low end it's uh, yeah. more, more like an SSL uh, I know they use these to do a lot of metal like Scandinavian metal and stuff they use these sapphires for that so I don't know oh that's good to know yeah. that's good to know um, that that's actually good. And you know, the crazy thing about the, the VLA, a lot of the metal guys put them on guitars. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that's that's good. To, that's good to know. But oh. yeah, um, I like I say, I love music. Um, the, the the little monitoring setup, I have a, a, a Atom T7V. Um, they're like the budget versions of the Atoms. Uh, I use pretty much budget gear. This was... We got this out of a barn. Um, big big shout out to Travis Atkinson. Yeah. Who pulled this out to pull this out of a barn for me. Um and cleaned it up, cleaned it up and deoxid everything. Um and just handed it to me and said, Hey, make it work. <laughs> question question for you. If I were to so the weak is the weak link of this board is vocals. Is is uh is vocals. It's easy to overcook a vocal on this board. It's just it's easy to burn a vocal bad. Um I want to replace, I want to stay in the analog domain as long as long as possible. If what's the best way of getting of replacing my EQ? Should I go 500 series? I got 12, essentially 12 channels for vocals. 12 channels, well, eight channels for vocals. I could either go 500 series or I could do like you've done on other videos. Y'all check out his videos. Other videos where you've actually taken multiple mixers. Mm -hmm, yeah. I stacked for, a couple of them together. For vocal EQ on a budget, if you needed to like get a stack of eight channels just for mixing in the analog domain vocals, would you recommend getting a 500 series rack with better signal chain or just grabbing a mixer from somewhere else? Like a side, using it as a sidecar for vocals. I would probably go with the sidecar just because the expense of the 500 series modules and you could probably find a decent analog board to use as a sidecar that would do the job so that's what i would gravitate towards but i like old weird stuff that people don't know about like the stevenson interface electronics mixers those those kinds of you know vintage mixers that may not be that well known but they've got some mojo to them and they usually yep. have you know good some good kind of eq whether it's inductor base or just the design of the circuit you know, the old Soundcraft stuff, some of the small, like the 200B or 200, is it 200B or 200? But they, the little small, smaller Soundcraft mixers, those have really good EQ. I mean, beyond replacing your board, the thing I'm thinking is if you need eight channels of EQ in a 500 series rack, that's going to get really pricey and probably you could get a sidecar mixer for less money. That's you know, th that might be, that might be the exact route that might be the exact route i go uh because because you know what there's a lot of guys that were like um oh what's this old boy name um he did elliot smith's work oh yeah I can't um his name. he did sound, a sound he's over in california rock block his name escapes me but he did a lot of elliot smith's work um snaps 
Rob Snap. Snap. Yeah, I've seen him on YouTube. He's got a bunch of good videos on YouTube. Or maybe there were other people's videos where they went to see him, but he's... Yeah, uh, it, Earthquaker Devices, Show Your Junk. Okay, yeah, that's what I've seen. Rob what? Schnapp. So he has his main board is a, is a heavily modified MCI where like he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, you know, mad scientist it out, but he also has a 12 channel, uh, DDA or something. I, I'm, I'm probably gonna misquote it, uh, misquote it, but it's the thought of there is this guy, he's doing release records. He's 90% outside of the box. And he has this sidecar mixer that he uses just for drums. And so I, I think about that. I think I like I honestly that is a, a, a possibility because uh, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you know, five five hundred series. The cheap route would be getting like DBX five thirties, right? And but those are like if you get them on the used market, so the rack is going to be five hundred five hundred dollars. The rack, the, the like if you get a Lindale five hundred series rack, ten space, that's five hundred bucks. That's just the rack. That's not gear. And I, 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 that's the problem. That's why I've wrestled with it for so long because I don't like the idea of purchasing just a rack. If I'm gonna spend five hundred bucks, um, uh, I'm not. I, I can't spin around the the, the the DBX whatever. You can get for a hundred bucks. So instead of getting a, a ten space rack, you get five DBX one sixty sixes. Now you got ten channels of compression for the cost of the rack. I mean, the, the the economics doesn't like the economics doesn't work. But yeah, but that's a good. Idea. Stevenson, Stevenson. That's that's you said. That's the that's the name of that mixer. Yeah, I've had two of those things. The they're actually the technically the company is Interface Electronics, and they were made in Houston, Texas, but have been out of business since my guess, sometimes in the late eighties. And they, uh, I've had a couple of those, and they are very interesting and kind of odd but i know the older ones the 100 series like i've shown in some of my videos those have inductor based eqs and the mic tran the mic mic preamps have buyer mic input transformers but those things they'll get kind of dirty and wooly on you if you're using the mic pre's but i'm guessing the eqs being inductor based eqs that's probably pretty good of course, old Yamaha stuff like the PM700, PM430, they're getting a little bit too pricey, but those have pretty good EQ. The Soundcraft 200, um, what was the other one I was thinking of? There's Soundcraft 200, the, the Soundcraft 200, or even the, the Soundcraft 1 or the 1S, the older Soundcraft that were made for live sound. Those are supposed to have pretty good EQ. So the thing is... Um, when you say the the only the Neves are known for having the Neve and 500 series, like the five, I'm gonna get the numbers. I don't even want to try to give you the wrong model number, but the Neve, uh, they're based on the 5088 console, have inductor EQs, and so it would be to be able to find a budget console sidecar that has inductor EQs, those type of EQs work really well on vocal. Right. Like, how many records do we know, like, ran through that had a Neve pre 1073 going into a Neve 1081 EQ going into an 1176? That's the, that's the, like, viable standard signal chain for, like, most records from the 70s on up. And so, yeah, if, to be able to get that, um, to be able to get that inductor EQ would be really, really, really good. I wish I knew more things that had them. I mean, the uh, Autotronics consoles, the uh, those that were, um, oh, Travis, our, our friend Travis used to have an Autotronics console and it, they had inductor based EQs. And then of course the Interface Electronics, which they also call those Stevenson because the guy who designed them, Lewis Stevenson. So those, some of the old Yamahas, like the PM1000. I don't know about the 700 or the 430 because I know they started using some op amps for some of the EQs, but I'm not sure when that happened. And of course, there's you know there's several uh, the older Alice mixers, which are kind of pricey now if you can find them. Those have pretty good EQ. And the old Soundcraft, 
I know the 200 doesn't have inductor EQ, but Soundcraft's generally known for their EQ. So I probably, I probably would want to get. I probably, I, I, I want. I try to buy stuff in topologies that I don't have, like to learn. Like I bought VCA compressors and FET compressors and opto compressors to learn the difference between which how they react. And so I really want to get something that's got a batch of uh, inductors because I I mean, op amp stuff is everywhere. But to be able to know the difference between all, hey, this is how inductor base EQ reacts versus this uh, this um, op amp based EQ. So that's the that's the thing. Um, the only thing that I know that has an inductor EQ that's in a budget round, and I, I won't even say budget, uh, but that's not. Well, I mean, everybody's money is different, you know. Like I, like I'm a frugal musician, so I, I um, but Black Lion, Black Lion Audio, oh, yeah. they have a channel strip that has a, a API ish type of pre and inductor EQ, but it's like 700 a watt. So if you need like eight of them joints, and I mean, you could print tracks. That's the thing. You can get two of them, and then you could just run. Uh, run your choruses through them, but when you mix in having, if you're doing vocals like in gospel choir thing, the choir thing is real big. You could have like 16 to 24 tracks of just one choir of vocals, and so to be able to have at least eight of those um, sitting on a mixer somewhere, you're able to throw your sopranos, cut out space for your alto section out of the sopranos, cut out space. Um, for your altos inside of your tenor section, and make things kind of meld together in a in a in a way. Um, but yeah, right. That's yeah. how I do it. I like to. It just takes extra time if you're gonna bounce something out through things like that because you've only got one. It takes your time. Yeah. And I like to mix quickly because I do that better in the analog domain anyway. I can mix quicker that way with my hands on knobs and knowing my gear better. Yep. So it seem, seems to me like you save some time by having more channels of that EQ or whatever it is you need so you can use that during the mix instead of having, okay, I'll EQ this and then balance it and then now I'll EQ the next one because it's going to take up a lot of time. Yeah. I got my brain, um, I drift. If I don't, if I have to mix quickly and I release quick, I release quick. We do about three or four releases a week and I release quickly so that you know all of us musicians overthink and if i don't commit to the sound i'll overthink i'll overthink and then the track won't get done you know we all have all our gerbils in our mind that like have us doubting our capabilities and doubting what we could do and so if if i don't it's kind of like you you got to take uh you got to take an effort approach to a certain degree, it's like, look, this is what I hear. This is what I think is best. Committed, right? Uh, you, you, you can sit. You can sit an EQ. You can sit an EQ a snare for days. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, I can't get it to sound right. So now let me put a sample and blend. Do I blend the sample with the original snare track, or do I replace it? You get into all these things. You go down these rabbit holes and take up all your Man, time. And commit, and, and uh, it's a saying we got in gospel. Um, you know, music on a hard drive don't bless nobody. Right. You know what I'm saying? Music on a hard drive don't bless nobody. If if you're not releasing music, it don't matter how perfect your music is. It's about what you can, the skill that you can duplicate every day. And so if you finish a song every day and you're mixing through your board and you're training yourself to mix fast, you in 360, okay, in 312 days, that's a six-day work week. If you do this six days a week and you take an hour and you quick mix songs, you done done that 312 times. You've trained yourself even more than somebody that then went to school. Somebody go to school, but you're mixing every day. You're literally training yourself. Uh, I'm an ear musician. I'm classically trained later. I can read music, but I started out by ear. And the more you do this by ear, the quicker you you get and you develop a certain sound, you know, uh, you develop a certain sound. You know, I'm just I'm about getting it done 
I love analog for that. I love analog for that. It makes me have to, it makes me, once I'm finished with the song and you strike the board and you reset that mug, you're not going to be able to do no recalls. Like that's, I, that, and, I, and I'm big on that. I tell my clients all the time, like, like I'm at a certain price point where I charge a hundred dollars a song, regardless of where their condition of their song is, I finish it for a hundred dollars. And so, no, you don't get a bunch of recalls. You get one mix, you get the track outs, and that's it because I got to be able to mix and move on to the next song in the analog, in the analog world, you get to mix this thing one time. And once you print that mix and you strike the board and move on to the next song, that mix may never be the mix that you do again or never be that exact same sound. But it, it feels like whenever you're mixing on the console with analog gear, it does come together faster. And so even if it's not perfect when you get done, cause you're mixing quickly, it still has a sound that you can be proud of because the, the gear, the gear just does something different and you can just kind of throw the faders up on here and I can feed this console with digital and just push the faders up and just and by the fact it's running through right. the board, it already sounds a lot better than it did in the box. And so I, then it's just ch changing a few things and sculpting the overall sound of it because once it starts going through the analog gear, it's already, you know, halfway there. Man, I love the separation. Like what I love about analog is that your you get a better separation between the sounds um you like i could take eight i could take you know a, a batch of eight drums and i could play eight drums out of the stereo bus you know out of the stereo bus inside of ableton and it just doesn't have the same level of life as those same eight drums ran out into the board with no e, no eq changes just the sound of coming out of converters into individual wires because even though we got 32 channels those 32 channels are not mathematically identical right. and so when you throw that mix up it's like it's reacting if you at the end of the day at the end of the day the mixer is a little bit warmer is you know it's the mixer been on all day and so it's going to react to sound differently then when you first get to the studio and you turn the mixer on, uh, your compressors, if they've been running all day, the, the tubes are hot. <laughs> and, and, and that thing, it, those imperfections breathe life into the music. And I think that that's what's missing. That's why, that's why I will always have a console, because you need imperfections in music. Man, this is, uh, I think that there needs to be more, uh, more collaborating um, between people in urban genres and rock-based genres, I think that there is a lot of really beautiful skill sets that can, like, merge. You know what I'm saying? I think sometimes we demonize one side or other. Oh, this guy uses samples. This is the devil. Or, man, I don't mic up drums. And, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, instead, of, instead of embracing the the workflow instead of embracing the passion and the skill set that comes behind it. Cause ultimately we all do the same thing. We track something in, we run it out through an EQ a reverb a delay a compressor, regardless of your genre. Um, and I think that each, the way each person approaches that there's a beauty in that, you know? Absolutely. I think the difference is if you can incorporate something into your workflow, that maybe producers in a different genre of music, that's a positive thing. And you see a lot of that. You see a lot of that now. Even some of the rock stuff now, and country even, has, you know, some of these hip hop. I'm trying to get gospel to I'm trying to get gospel to embrace like drop tuning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm trying to get like gospel choirs to like do like a uh, system of a down and like rage against the machine type stuff. Uh they 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 they, they kicked me out of the church for that. Um, you know what? Uh, I do appreciate the conversation. It has uh, offline. I am going to definitely pick your brain about a lot of this inductor basic cues. Um, please, with your community, I'm gonna also send a flyer for my production work. Um, I have probably the lowest cost and the fastest turnaround time in my genre, which is gospel. 
Um, but if someone wants an arrangement of work or keys on a, on a project, I can pretty much get, uh, you know, production done for them within 24 hours. And so, you know, I want to definitely uh, share those services with your base. Super, super, super. Well, I appreciate you. Um, I do have to do have to hop off, man. But man, it's always a pleasure, man. You have a blessed one. You too. Thank you so much for doing this. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Have a good one. You too. Take care.